Welcome to Museums Matters, a series of FB live streams by the Vival Group, Chinatown Museum, and the Iloilo Museum of Contemporary Art in collaboration with the National Historical Commissions of the Philippines Museums. Museums Matter aims to be a platform for museums and a resource for teachers who are looking to museum collections to support digital learning. I'm Yuri Tamura, a museum officer and your host for the Museums Matters live streams. Teaching Philippine history with museum artifacts and collections looks into the collections of selected historical museums, such as Chinatown Museum and selected NHCP museums, such as Museo El Deposito, Museo ni Emilio Aguinaldo, as well as the Museo ng Katipunan Pinaglabanan Memorial Shrine. It aims to give teachers more insight on the breadth of these historical collections and museum educational programs for them to utilize these during their online lectures. Today, we are joined by Janine Cabato of Chinatown Museum, Janelle Rabusa of Museo El Deposito, Christian Melendez of Museo ng Katipunan, and Heidi Paulette Medrus of Museo ni Emilio Aguinaldo. So the structure of today's talk will begin with a general description of each museum to be followed by a showcase of museum collections and museum programs, after which we will show the museum's online programs and of course their contact information so that you can get in touch with our speakers. So let's get the talk going. We will begin with Janine from our very own Chinatown Museum. So Janine Cabato, <coughs> Excuse me, is currently the curator of Chinatown Museum at Binondo, Manila. She has worked with NCCA sponsored art festivals at Mindanao, and before putting up Spark Museum at the La Salle Santiago Isabel School, she utilized her teaching license to share her love of art to high school students. Janine has an art management degree from the Ateneo de Manila University. She's in her element when immersing in creative projects, museums, and education. And she is most happy when she is with her dogs or in her hometown of Sambanga City. Janine, come on in. Hello, thank you, Yuri. Hello, everyone, especially to the teachers, parents, and history enthusiasts. I will be giving you a brief overview of Chinatown Museum, its contents, and most especially the programs which you could utilize once you do your online learning. Chinatown Museum is located at the fourth floor of Lucky Chinatown Mall in Reina Regente at Binondo, Manila. The museum's content was done in consultation with academics from National Historical Commission of the Philippines and National Commission for Culture and the Art. It opened last June 2019, and to start off, I'd like to check your prior knowledge on why our museum exists. So we will be doing a poll and I would like to see your answers. What do you think is Chinatown Museum about? Is it exclusively about Manila's oldest Chinatown? Is it about Binondo and its history? Or is it about Filipino Chinese history only? You will be seeing a poll there. I'd like you to click on your answers so that I could at least have a grasp of what you know about the museum. If you visited it, you would know what it is about. So this is just for fun. There, however, is a correct answer. So there's only one correct answer. I'll repeat, is it exclusively about Manila's oldest Chinatown? Or is it about Binondo and its history? And the last one is, is it about Filipino Chinese history? So the last one is the social history of um, the group of people. Let's see. Please write your answers. I will be checking the poll. I know that um, there are more than a thousand of you, 1.3 people watching, so all around the Philippines. I know that most of you have not been to uh, Chinatown yet. So uh, this is really just to check what you know about the museum, if you've heard of it, if you haven't heard of it. So it will at least give me an idea. And the answer is most people answer that C, it is about the Filipino Chinese at 57%. And then um, only 27% answered that it's about Binondo 
And the last one is it's exclusively about Manila's oldest Chinatown. So the correct answer is that it is B. It is about Binondo and its history because we're talking about it in general aspects, right? The A answer is if it's about the oldest Chinatown is that Chinatown is just a small part of Binondo, but since one of the reasons why we named it Chinatown Museum was because it was located in, mo in the mall. The name of the mall is Lucky Chinatown, so that's why you have the Chinatown Museum for branding. But the content basically revolves around Binondo as a whole. And within Binondo, we get to discuss Chinatown, which I mentioned is just a small percentage of it, and also the Filipino Chinese history. But just to plug also, if you're looking for the history of Filipino Chinese and its social history, we have our neighboring um, museum, which is Bahay Chinoy in Ipremuros. So they really talk about it more in depth. The Chinatown Museum really goes into Binondo, its trade relations, Escolta, which is more about banking and being the first financial district in the entire country there. So we will be showing you the introduction to Binondo. There. Okay. So its collections and museum programs revolve around Binondo as one of the oldest Chinatowns in the world. It's a misnomer to say that Binondo is the only and it's the oldest Chinatown because it is not. Actually, there's um, an, a Chinatown also in Indonesia and also a Chinatown in Cebu. And during those times, it really wasn't a written history, right? So we don't really know exactly when it started. Although Binondo started, uh, the written history was on 1596, we could... Uh, we could really say that even before the Spanish arrived, Binondo was already there. There was trade going on with the Chinese um, way prior. Also the Arabs came in. But um, to say that it is the oldest Chinatown is really, uh, we don't really rely on that. So we say it's one of the oldest. And what you are looking right now is uh, letters y figuras, it's letters and figures. So this was an art form created during the Spanish times. And it, you will see the tipos de país. Tipos de país is the types of the country. País means country. So you could see the tobacco, cigarreras, people, and letter B. Um, we have religious influences, the Santo Cristo de Longos. If um, you are familiar with Binondo Church, this is at the side of Binondo Church. So you have that. We will be discussing, uh, just in brief lang, the Trenvia, the Pancitero, which is the letter O. Of course, when you go to Binondo, you will see Divisoria. So those are the vendors, letter N and letter O. And during the Spanish times, we had the Cascos, which is on letter D. So we will be just choosing some few figures to discuss on um, in a bit. All right. So the topics that we will handle is about geography, history, and art. What exactly could you discuss about Chinatown Museum is these three topics. In geography, it's the strategic location near Intramuros, Pasig River, and Manila Bay which means that because it is a port area, you have a lot of exchanges happening. Aside from trade, the exchange of language and is also exchange of ideas. In terms of history, Binondo talks about, um, really looks into the Spanish colonial period, Philippine Revolution, because here you have uh, Gregoria de Jesus marrying Andres Bonifacio in Binondo Church, you do have Jose Rizal staying in Hotel de Oriente in Binondo. And um, American colonial period, you will also see the bombing, World War II, which we had an exhibition about. So most of this, we already have this in our website, um, if you want to know more. So for art, 
I showed you a while ago, we have letras ifiguras and we also have tipos de Paris. Just to give you a run through of our museum galleries, we have, you will see here, 17 galleries. That's all the way from mission settlement, the Dominican mission settlement, uh, trade, colonial businesses, industries. Of course, we tackle Philippine revolution, the Trendia, and Binondo as the financial district. But for this brief talk, I would only like to highlight four galleries. More specifically, the Alcaiseria, which is the trading area during the Spanish colonial times. And it also is the last Parian. For the industries, we will get to discuss more in depth on the tobacco as the cash crop. So if you are teaching social studies on the tobacco monopoly, banking industry, financial district, we will get to discuss it today. And um, the Trendia. The Trendia is uh, a very, it's a very good type for SA because during that time, we were really the envy of all of Asia because we were ahead of our time. But uh, right now you could see that we always have traffic. If not for the pandemic, you, you'd know that Metro Manila because of its population, is just filled with traffic, all right? So the last one is Escolta, where we will delve into the businesses that flourish during that time, okay? So for the first gallery, this is how it looks. This is the Alcaiseria, and it is a silk market, basically. So this octagonal structure served as the last parian. You will see on our next slide that there really was a space for the ground floor shops. It was created octagonal in structure, like a bagua, no? very Chinese. And its second floor was the lodging area for all the Chinese traders that would come in. So technically, if you look at it, yes, it is a nice structure, but it also was a way to contain the Chinese. So very ghetto-like. And within, the, within this Alcaiseria, you could get to discuss topics on, our next slide is the Spanish colonial history, world, world trade and commerce, and the galleon trade, which is the Torna Viaje. So as I mentioned a while ago, we do have a very strategic location where it's near Manila Bay. So once the galleons arrive, it goes before there was not much silt yet, some of the ships would go in all the way to the Alcaiseria area where it also acts as an aduana, a customs house. So one of the reasons why you also have Bibisoria as the Bagsakan area was because also during that time, it already was a Bagsakan area. So you could see, you know, port areas are very significant in a way. When you have economy thriving, you also have um, money coming in. And with money, banking comes in and so on and so forth. So everything was just a logical progression from Binondo during that time to the Binondo of what it was during its height, which was pre-war. And then after that, you have its decline and, uh, of course, what we know of Binondo today, right? So just to check... Um, I'd like to know if you think the Alcaiseria still exists today. You can either vote yes and or no, right? So don't vote or, it's just yes or no. Does the Alcaiseria still exist? Actually, the name Alcaiseria came from the, came from the, uh, Arab term, al -gaiser. it's a silk, silk market. So, bagsakan siya ng silk and bagsakan siya of um, textiles. So, right now, the bagsakan of textiles is in Azcaraga. It's Azcaraga Street in Binondo. And there you will find this entire area just filled with cloth. Okay? So, i just like to check. Do you think the Alcaiseria still exists today? Yes or no? 
We'll see your, your answers in a bit. This is quite fun because okay, checking your answers and it's. 74% said, yes, the al still exists. And only 44 people, that's 26% answered, no, it doesn't exist. The correct answer is that it does not exist anymore. Although, I'd like you to, to look at the octagonal structure there. That is the al floor plan. So you will see that. It does not exist anymore, but right now it's Pedro Guevara Elementary School. So if you look at it bird's eye view, it still has its octagonal structure, but the school basically placed up buildings to fill in the space. So it's sad that it wasn't, uh, wasn't maintained. But then again, we're talking about this was 1700 end of 1700. So all the way to it, even the past through World War, there were a lot of things that were going on, right? So uh, when we went in Pedro Guevara Elementary School, way back when we were creating the museum, I was able to see the last standing wall. Imagine that, eaten by an acacia tree. So it was not maintained at all and really sayang, you know, but so if you'd like to learn more about the al Sevilla, we have just recreated photos, illustrations of how the, how the trade happened inside. Basically, there was a botica that was inside. So medicines were being sold, textile was even sold, ceramics. There were broken pieces of shards of ceramics that were there. And um, we talk about this more in the gallery. For our next gallery that I would like to highlight, it's the industries in Binondo. First is the tobacco industry born because of the tobacco monopoly. We're talking about 100 years, 1760s all the way up to 1860s, where the government made use of um, tobacco as a cash crop. And then during the height also, we have on the right side, you will see Binondo as the first financial district, we do have quite a number of banks that we highlighted at the same time, most especially Capital Theater, which also became the Wall Street. Basically, it was the, the stock exchange center during that time. So Escolta was really very ahead in terms of it having the first air-conditioned mall, first banks, you have uh, investment in terms of um, infrastructure and the skyscrapers of the time would reach up to six floors during a time when there were really just structures made of wood, basically. I'd like to delve more into the tobacco monopoly and you will see here that we have this collection it was given to us by Ed de Los Santos. So you will see that most of our artifacts basically are already digitized. They're images. And that's why it's e it was easy for us to transition digitally because we were able to uh, put it up and create a story about it. You'll see most of this in our website. So if you would like to get more um, good resolution photos, do send us an email or um, get in touch with us through our Facebook account, all right? So here in the images that you could see, you could talk about two things. It's that Binondo was used really as a, it was a mushrooming cottage industry filled with cigarreras. The, the houses were being used as factories and children children, women, they would roll tobacco. So this was the main source of income of almost the, you know, the majority of the business during that time. And the main goal really was for to increase government revenue so that they wouldn't solely rely on the galleon trade. Once 
the tobacco would be arriving from Cagayan Valley, this is all the way up north, right? It would arrive in Binondo just for rolling, drying, rolling, packaging, and then it was sent out for exports, right? So the challenges here during the tobacco monopoly was that it was being abused by the government. So, you know, kids would find this interesting because if you pace it also in a way where uh, you could see Rizal's photos here, it was in a way very into the, the slowly people understanding that they were longing for Philippine independence. So Rizal's photos here were really uh, pulling people, inviting people to into Philippine independence, getting away from the colony. You could see on the right side, KKK, so subliminal siya. Unconsciously, people that time, because there was no sense of uh, no sense of advertisements during that time, it was really through the tobacco packaging. Right? After the tobacco monopoly, we do have La Insular Cigar and Cigarette Factory, and this is one of the areas highlighted in, in the museum also. So this is just right beside Binondo Church and also at the side of Hotel de Oriente. In La Insular Cigar and Cigarette Factory, you have cigarreras working. They were the ones rolling it. And uh, one of the trivias here is that in the next slide, you could see them being the main labor workers, all right? So you... Uh, for a, for a time, they even protested their minimum wage. These are, you know, very specific things that you don't really see in history books, but it's very interesting because this was the, I, I'd like to say that this was the call centers of the time. If you are a cigarera, that means you're earning your keep, you're earning your money. And in fact, it uplifts them no? that they could um, work on their own without having a husband, right? So. For a long time, this really was their main source of livelihood. One of the things that we would also like to highlight in the galleries is the Trandia. In the Trandia, we have a horse-drawn one. There you go. And as I mentioned a while ago, one of the reasons why Manila was called the Paris of Asia was that it was a cosmopolitan city. So, and it really was the envy of most of Southeast Asia because it had an efficient public transport system. When everyone was still having uh, uh, not, so, not so efficient transport systems, we already had this and then we were moving all the way to uh, once the Americans came in, electricity also came in. And you will see here that it was an extensive mode of public transportation. So it went all the way up to Malate, from Binondo all the way to Malate and San Paloc area, also San Miguel. So it reached Malacanang. What does this mean and what does this say? This says that, as I said, we were ahead of our time. The population was still small, although there were... Um, the research says that may, a lot of people were really rushing to ride the Trantia, Nagakasikipan, but even then, it still was efficient on its own. Because you could see this, but we don't have this anymore now. So the next question is, what happened to it? Well, World War happened. And there were, we did an exhibit uh, last February. This was to look into the 75th, 75th commemoration of World War II, we also discussed what happened to the Trandia there. So you will find this information in our website also. The last thing that I would like to really skim over are our, our trivia and our contents on it. So here you have luxury shops. American Bazaar, 
you have uh, German dispensaries, French luxury shops, and there actually are more. We delve into this and you could see photos of this also in our website. What does this say? This means that Chinatown per se, which right now equates to Binondo, but you know, before Escolta was Escolta, Chinatown was Chinatown. But right now when we say Binondo, it means Binondo as a whole and sometimes people even equate it to Chinatown as a whole. But back then, Escolta was the Makati of that time, which is kind of right now BGC. And in Escolta, you will see this. All the there were no malls yet, so to speak. There were shops. The shops were really where everyone would dress up and everyone would go shopping. But also because it was the Spanish colonial time, Chinese could speak Tagalog and also Spanish and vice versa. So everyone spoke Spanish. They taught in Spanish. They conversed in Spanish. But um, Interestingly, the advertisements then were also multilingual. So we also have that, and it's one of the things that we will be pushing online also, how everyone spoke in different languages but understood each other, right? So just to correct a, um, a pers perspective or perception that you have of China. It was for during the colonial book the should be. So a lot of the shops at that time um, had multilingual advertisements. It had often, like when you look at the caption, you would have the um, details in English, Tagalog, and Chinese. So the ad is not written here, but we also have ads um, around the museum, which we hope to put up at some point. Um, that talk about, um, it's a medicinal receipt where it writes down the instructions in English, Tagalog, and Spanish. So although we're called Chinatown, we are by no means a town of Chinese people. We in fact are a multicultural port city and you will see this kind of phenomenon in a lot of port cities in the Philippines and around the world. So thank you, Yuri. Okay. Thank you, Yuri. Sorry, I got that off. All right. We do miss our visitors. So one of the reasons why we're doing this talk is for us to be able to bring the museum to the people. In our next slide, you could see Can you hear me? Right. In our next slide, you could see that we have our tours here pre-COVID. So we really miss having visitors in the museum. So one of the reasons why we are doing this, our live streams and also pushing for digital content is that we would really like to bring the museum to everyone, all right? How do we do this? You will see our online programs. There. The articles that we have right now are on Beyond the Church, Beyond the Streets, Calle Escolta, Escolta Establishments, of course, Jones Bridge and the Tranvia. We do have downloadable activities also for little kids. These are very good for kinder up to grade two. Our live streams are right now in face, both Facebook and YouTube for History Matters and Museum Matters. This is all in partnership also with Iloilo Museum of Contemporary Art, which is our sister museum based in Iloilo City. So for collaborations, we do get to have speakers who are local historians, artists, history enthusiasts. And our coming slides later, you will be seeing the uh, what we have in store for August and also for September. Okay, 
So for our website, you will see this and you could get ideas for lessons. When you click on the Learn tab, when you click on the Learn tab, there will be a drop down button and then you will see all of the topics which I mentioned a while ago. So, for example, when you click on Beyond the Streets, in our next slide, you will see the learn and the etymology of the words. So why is it called Reina Regente Street? Why is it called Del Pan, Benavides, Juan Luna? Of course, it's because of Juan Luna. But before, we mentioned there that it was Anluage, before Juan Luna even existed. Anluage means carpenter. So these very uh, interesting tidbits about um, how street names came to be is right there. Okay. Uh, also for the Trenvia, what I mentioned a while ago, we have it if you would like to talk about this with, with, this, with your students, we do have more photos which you could pull out. For our live streams and videos, we do have um, this in, please subscribe to Museums Matter. That is our Chinatown Museum videos. Okay, so for Wikan Pamana this August, we have something like this. We will be posting also etymology of the words. So for example, misik came from me in chick and pansitero, piansit came from pansit, it's hukien, so it means convenient food. Those are just some of our examples. You will have more of these if you follow our Facebook page. All right, just to share really quickly, we have our August lineup for next August 8th, next Saturday, we have Half Contemporary Art Museum programs support blended learning. This is in partnership with Ateneo Art Gallery and Yuchenko Museum. For August 15th, we have Virtual Urban Sketch with Aurelio Castro III. This is very perfect for students and also um, art artists. You could, you could illustrate together with our artists. So our last one is on August 22, Eat, Walk, Talk with Binondo's Community Food Heritage. For September, you will see collections. We have um, cool collections, meaning. So numismatics, all those who collect stamp, uh, no, coins, bills, coins, you will have um, September 5 for that. And then Filipino blades, these are, this will be shared on September 12. I'm also right now, sharing our contact information please screen cap this or follow us if you do have any ways to collaborate with us any ideas please get in touch through our email right there thank you for having me thanks for that janine up next we'll, we will be highlighting three museums from the national historical commission of the philippines so just to clarify there are 27 museums by the NHCP, but today we will be discussing three of them. So our next speaker for the talk is Janelle Brinas Rabusa, who obtained his bachelor's degree in tourism management at the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Santa Mesa, Manila. He entered government service in the NHCP as a museum guide at the Museo ng Paglilitis ni Andres Bonifacio in Cavite. In 2017, he served as the officer in charge of Museo ni Jesse Robredo in Naga City, Camarina Sur, after which he was assigned to be the curator of the Museum of Philippine Economic History in Iloilo City, NHCP's first museum in the Western Visayas area. Currently, Janelle is the shrine curator of Museo El Deposito, a museum focused on the history of Manila's former waterworks and water reservoir based in San Juan City. So everybody, let's please welcome Janelle Rabusa onto our show. Janelle, let's get your talk going. Hello, Yuri. Thank you for the introduction. So again, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Janelle, and I'll introduce to you to one of the museums of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, which is the Museo El Deposito, located at Pinaglabanan Memorial Shrine, Barangay Corazon de Jesus, San Juan City, Metro Manila. So let now begin the flow of our history. Okay, about our museum, uh, we just opened last year, last February of 2019. Uh, we just actually celebrated our first anniversary weeks before the community quarantine. 
So again, we are one of the 27 museums of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. And to those who are asking, uh, our museum is actually free of charge. You can enter our museum for free uh, and the rest of the museums of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. So our museum is actually focused on the history of the water system of Manila and the El Deposito. So what is El Deposito anyway? So here's the question, why El Deposito? So before we answer that question, let me introduce to you to our official mascot here on the screen. You will see Med. So uh, Med is actually based on the design of our logo. The reason why his name is Med is because the acronym of our museum is Museo El Deposito, M-E-D, Med. So the waves that you will see in his body and his head uh, symbolizes the waves of water. On the other hand, you will notice his mask. It's actually the Baybayan script ka. So the Baybayan script ka symbolizes kasaysayan. So we show here the kasaysayan ng tubig ng kamay nilaan during the 19th century. So let's now answer that point of IL. So this is one of the collections of our museum. So this is a scale model of the Pinaglabanan Memorial Shrine where the museum is located. So you will see on the screen the yellow arrow that points out our building. So the, uh, the Pinaglabana Memorial Shrine is declared as a national historical shrine. So I think the next speaker will discuss that. So a closer view, you will see here the building of the museum. And if you've been to the Pinaglabana Memorial Shrine, all you can see actually is an open field of grass and trees on the side. But actually there's something underneath the Pinaglabana Memorial Shrine. So you will see the lines in this scale model right here. You will notice the, uh, those tunnels with lights. So these actually are the tunnels underneath El Deposito, which serves as the water reservoir of Manila during the 19th century. So let me uh, give you a actual view of the tunnel. So this is the actual view of the tunnel underneath El Deposito. So a lot of people, akala nila parang open field lang siya pagdating sa Pinaglaban Memorial Shrine, but actually there's something underneath. So the Pinaglabanan Memorial Shrine where the museum is located used to be as the El Deposito de Aguas. That's the reason why our museum is named Museo El Deposito. So it's the uh, El Deposito de Aguas of the Manila Water Works System where the water coming from San Mateo River, which is now Marikina River, is kept and stored before being delivered to the parts of Manila and its uh, suburbs or Arabales. So uh, the El Deposito back then, the water reservoir of El Deposito has a capacity back then of 56,000 cubic meters and it could provide water supply to 300,000 people. Back then it was enough because back then during the time of the 19th century, uh, the population of Manila is around 290,000. Okay, so this is actually uh, one of also one of our collections. So we will show you the map of water system of Manila. So on the map, you will, uh, this plan was actually made by Genaro Palacios. So he was the one that designed the El Deposito and the water work system. Now, another fact, Genaro Palacios was also the same one that designed the steel church of San Sebastian in Quiapo, Manila. So in his plan, uh, the source of water is the San Mateo River and the Marikina River, which is pointed in a blue arrow on the uh, right corner of the screen there. And in order to deliver the water uh, from the Marikina River to the San Juan del Monte Reservoir, a pumping station in San Tolan was built, particularly in the area now of Libis. And then after that, series of cast iron, uh, cast iron tubes were connected in order to deliver the water from the source to the reservoir and then from the reservoir to the destination, which is the parts of Manila. So you will see in the middle, the uh, San Juan del Monte. Now, the reason why San Juan del Monte was chosen to be the location of the, uh, the water supply of Manila is because of uh, the elevation of San Juan. If you've been to San Juan, mapapansin nyo, pataas or hill type yung uh, geography ng San Juan. Kaya naging angkop yung pagiging uh, hill type nito sa pag-store ng tubig ng Manila. And then para mas madaling ma-deliver yung tubig from the San Juan del Monte to the parts of Manila. So let's uh, proceed to the next part. So these are the galleries of the museum. So we only have three galleries. So the first gallery is the Carriedo Waterworks. 
So here in the first gallery, we showed, of course, the water supply before the water work system, the donation of Francisco Carriedo and the plans for the water work system. Before the Hinalo Palacios plan, there were other plans that were studied before they come up with the plan of getting water from the San Mateo River. And then on the second gallery, we have the water reservoir. So this gallery shows the plans of Hinalo Palacios, his plans of uh, the building of the El Deposito, the pumping stations, and the series to connect the water from the source to the destination. And then on the third gallery, we also presented as a national shrine. So we uh, featured here on this uh, gallery what happened to El Deposito during the time of the Philippine Revolution, during the time of uh, World War II, and then what happened to it when it stopped its operations. So let's proceed to the next part. So here are the collections of our museum. Most of our collections are historical and archeological collections. When we say historical collections, these are artifacts that illustrates historical events, periods, personalities, etc. So here we have on the upper part, you will see some collections that shows uh, this, uh, the event of World War II. So, and of course, you will see on the other side, uh, the, the actual water hydrant that was used in the water work system of Manila during the 19th century. And we also have some collections of the commemorative coins and stamps that were issued during the inauguration of the water system of Manila. And then on the other hand, we also have the archaeological collections. Uh, the archaeological collections are objects with historical or artistic value uh, from our, uh, archaeological surveys that were, uh, that were happened here. So uh, actually, uh, the UP Archaeological Studies made an investigation in this area in 2016. And these are some of the art artifacts they got in the study during that year. And of course, we have some other collections. We also have some replicas and scale models of the parts of the waterwork system. We have some replicas of the water filters that were used before the water system was built. We also have the replica of the Corriedo Fountain. And of course, we have a full view of the water hydrant because the one we showed a while ago, the original one, that, uh, we, uh, that was actually, we loaned it from the Itambus administration. This, on the other hand, we featured the whole uh, of the water hydrant. So you will notice there, there is a lion head on the water hydrant. So numalabas yung tubig doon sa mouth ng lion during that time. And then we also have some digital photos and prints. We have the digital copies of the plants used during the time of the building of the El Deposito and the waterworks system that we got from the different archives in Spain. We also have some illustrations of Jose Jolonato Luzan and some copies of the photos from the John Pebble collection. Now, so we presented to you some of our collections. So we have some suggested modes of interaction that teachers can use in using uh, the collections of ours in online teaching. So we have compare and contrast, recreate the object, observe and record, reflect, and create the narrative. So these activities are actually a part of the teacher's guide we are currently formulating right now in line with the shift to online learning. So our activities, we want it to not only to be hands-on, but also to be minds-on. Okay. So, okay, Paul, let me ask you first a question. Where do you currently get your drinking water? Is it A, source water refilling station? Is it directly B, directly to your water line system? Or C, from your deep wells, uh, jetmatic pumps, so I want to know your answers. I think not, uh, we have some viewers not only from Manila, but from different parts of the country. So Yuri, what's your answer in this poll? For me, it's B. Yeah. B, from your water line system directly. Yeah, we do have a direct water line. We're fortunate enough. But I am very curious what it's like to have a deep well yes. <laughs> beside my house to get my water. Kayo po. Well, me on the, uh, of course, we're drinking water. We uh, usually buy from water refilling stations. I think some, uh, most of the viewers can relate to me on that. And of course, on other use of water, we also have our water line system. So I think my answer is A and B. <laughs> so in oh. Apple, let's see your answers. Okay. So most of the viewers answered letter A from stores and water refilling station with a 60, uh, 66%. 
And then second is from the waterline with 21%. And then, of course, 13% of our viewers still have deep wells and jetmatic pumps still in their homes. I think mostly from the province areas, meron pa rin maga nito. Okay. So let's now proceed to the next one. Okay. So this is the first activity. So this is compare and contrast. So we featured here the collection of the museum that shows an aguador. So the reason I asked that question a while ago, because I want to show you what is the source of water back then before the El Deposito and the waterwork was made. Back then in Manila, before the waterwork system was made, the source of water is in, of course, the Great Pasig River. So mostly they get their water in the parts of Pasig River. They preferred actually the parts of Guadalupe area of the Pasig River because for them, according to them, it's cleaner than the rest of the other parts of the uh, Ilog Pasig. Of course, they also discovered uh, different sources of water here in Manila. Like for example, uh, the Dominicans discovered a spring in San Juan del Monte here in, here in the location, uh, in the area nearby the museum. So they found a spring here in San Juan del Monte. And then of course, other houses, uh, some of the houses uh, has their own water cisterns in their household. They usually collect what rainwater in order to have water supply. So I think they tawag nating alhibe. So yung mga bahay may mga alhibe, they collect the water from the gutters uh, in the roofs tuwing umulan. Ayan. So in this picture, we showed here a picture of Guadalot. So Guadalot is actually the one that delivers the water from the source to the household. So here in this activity, what the teachers can do is they can let the students compare how water was delivered back then and how water is delivered now. So in the picture, you will see the aguador carrying two large uh, tapayans or banga. And then on the other side, you will see a picture, a present picture of a man preparing his water delivery. So how are they different? How are they similar? So with this activity, compare and contrast, so by focusing students thinking on analyzing pair of ideas, the compare and contrast strategy strengthens uh, students' ability to remember the key content, which is nga, how the water was delivered back then. So this kind of activity enhances the capability of students in applying past knowledge to new situations or events. So uh, with this activity, we can make history more relevant to their everyday life. So dati, ang tubig, ang presyo ng tubig is around two and a half to three centavos per tinaha. So the unit of the is equal to more or less 25 gallons. So ganun yung presyo dati ng tubig. And then kung ngayon, I think, uh, for example, in this area, ang presyo ng tubig ngayon is around 20 to 25 pesos per 5 gallons. Yung parang malaking bote na nalalagay sa water dispenser. So doon, madi-differentiate natin yung presyo ng tubig at saka yung presyo ngayon ng tubig. And then dati, ang presyo ng tubig nag-iiba based on the source of water. Pag galing sa Ilog Pasig, that is two and a half uh, cents. Pero pag galing sa mas malinis na source, like for example, the San Juan Spring, it costs 12 and a half cents. So nagkakaiba talaga based on the quality of water. So with this kind of activity, you can do it to your students para at least mas makita nila yung kaibahan ng noon at ngayon. So next slide. So of course, another activity that we can... Uh, we can ask you to do is recreate the objects. So this uh, model that you see right now is actually the model of water filters that was used during the 1830s and the 1850s. So these were designs made by the Gobernador General Pascual Enrile and Gobernador General Antonio Maria Blanco. During that time kasi, napakalaking issue ng marinis na tubig. So during that time, there was an epidemic of cholera in the Philippines. And because of that, the government of the Spanish government was alarmed in the rising cases of the, epi of the epidemic in the Philippines. That's, that's why they asked everyone to filter their water. So with this filter water, what the students can do is that they can recreate history by uh, recreating the uh, water filters. So using recyclable materials, they can recreate the water filter design by Gobernador General Pascual Inivide and Ramon uh, and Gobernador Blanco. So they can uh, demonstrate the finished product in the class. So itong water filter ito, we made it a digital copy para mas kalinaw. So if you will move to the next part. So this is the digital copy of the designs of Pascual and Lile and 
uh, Gobernador Blanco. So in their water filter back then, what they use is uh, sand, coal, and then yung sinamay na tela, and then kumamit sila nung kahoy na may mga butas para masala yung tubig. So sinasala talaga nilang maigi yung tubig para masigurado nilang malinis yung kanilang iniinom. Because back then, clean water is very crucial and it's very hard to get. So after, after filtering the water, ang gagawin pa nila actually is they will boil the water for 30 minutes. So ganun katagal para lang ma-make sure na malinis yung tubig na kanilang iniinom. So these are the artifacts related to the period where the El Deposito and the waterworks was not yet made, was not yet built. So if we proceed to the next part, here, another activity is observe and record. So this is actually one of our collections. This is the commemorative claim on the opening of the, uh, the opening of the waterworks system. Actually, with this object, we could already tell the whole story of the inauguration of uh, the waterworks system in 1882. So by observing and record, you can ask your students to observe the different markings that they see on the coins. For example, they will read Gobernando Filipinas and General Marquez de Estella. They will also read Cariedo y Municipio de Manila in the middle. And then they will see Reynando Alfonso Doce. And in the middle, they will see Commemoración de la Traida de Aguas Potables. And of course, they will see the date, uh, 24th of July, 24 de Julio, 1882. So they can ask the students to have a research on this uh, markings. Actually, since we are now on the online platform, we can ask the students to have research in the tip of their hands. Madali na ngayon mag-search actually sa Google as long to make sure na credible yung sources natin. So they can ask the students to have a research first on this. And then after that, the teacher can discuss what are those characters that they saw in the object. So for us to answer what are these markings all about, let's proceed to the next part. Okay, so una nating nakita, Gobernando Pilipinas and General Marquez de Estella. So akala natin Marquez de Estella is a name, akakalain ng iba. Actually, the Marquez, is, Marquez de Estella is a title. So this is the title of the Governor General of the Philippines during the time of the inauguration of the Manila Waterworks System, which is Fernando Primo de Rivera. So he was the one that inaugurated the Manila Waterworks System on July 24, 1882. So he also played an important role in Philippine history when he was the governor general during the truce between the Philippine revolutionaries at the Pak of Biak na Bato. And then the next character that we saw is here, the Cariedo Pampin. So here in the, the Cariedo, you will see the name Cariedo. So who is Cariedo? I think a lot of people from Manila are hearing this name, Cariedo especially when they write the LRT, Carriedo Station, Carriedo Station. So actually, the name of the station is based on the name of this person, Carriedo. He is Francisco Carriedo E. Peredo. He was the one who funded the building of the waterwork system of Manila by donating 10,000 pesos to the Ayuntamiento or the Municipio of Manila in 1730. So because of his donation, the waterworks became a reality for the people of Manila during the 1882. And then the next marking that we saw a while ago in the coin is the Reynando Alfonso XII. So who is Reynando Alfonso XII? So King Alfonso XII was the king of Spain during the inauguration of Manila Waterworks and the Carriedo Fountain. So that's why nandoon yung pangalan niya. So doon, doon palang sa coin, nakita na natin yung mga people involved in that part of history. So on the next part, so here, you will see Commemoración de la Traida de Aguas Potables. So it means the inauguration of the uh, Manila Waterworks or uh, the waterworks system in the Carriedo Fountain. So the inauguration of the water fountain happened on uh, 24th of July, 1882. So here we have also have a collection of the photo of the Carriedo Fountain after the inauguration of 1882. So we are actually preparing now some of our collections uh, for it to be digitalized in order for it to be shared to you, to especially to the teachers, in order for it for you to be used in your teaching. Okay. So in the last decade of the 19th century, there were 390 fountains and 280 watt, uh, hydrants. So ito po yung fountain on the left side and then the hydrants on the right side. Now, 
both the cast iron fountain and hydrants were from abroad. So they were made by the Andrew Hanneside and Co. in England. Okay. Okay, another uh, question. So let's us test your knowledge about the Carriedo Fountain. Our question is, where is the original Carriedo Fountain currently located? Again, where is the original Carriedo Fountain currently located? Okay, so here we have San Palok, Manila. That's letter A. Letter B, we have Santa Cruz, Manila. Letter C, is it in Intramuros? So I think people in the Manila part knows the answer. But I just want to test what is your answer in this question. So you will see here uh, the fountain, the photo of the fountain. Actually, the centerpiece of the fountain was just added two years after the inauguration of the Carriada Fountain. If you've noticed a while ago in the slide, you see that there was no centerpiece in the fountain. But uh, is a, uh, the, the centerpiece was added two years in honor of Francisco Carriedo. So let me see what are your answers. So, okay. So I think uh, some of you might be confused because they have, maybe they have seen this fountain in a different area, I guess. Because actually another fun fact, uh, this is not the only found, this is not the only fountain that has a design in the whole world. There are actually three of them. One is in Brazil, in the Botanical Gardens of Rio de Janeiro, and another one is in Singapore. So there are actually three kinds of this fountain. So let us see your answers. Okay, so most of you answered letter B, Santa Cruz, Manila. Okay, your answer is correct. It is in Santa Cruz, Manila. It is currently located at the Plaza Santa Cruz. So if you proceed to the next part. Okay, so this is the history of the water fountain of El Deposito. So in 1882, it was inaugurated at the Rotonda de San Palo. It is now the area of the Nagtahan Interchange. So if you will notice back then, as I said a while ago, there was still no centerpiece fountain on the part of that area. It was just added two years after the inauguration. And then during the 1970s, uh, the fountain was relocated. So from Manila, from Nagtahan, it was relocated in Balara, Quezon City, in front of the MWSS building. I think some people who are viewing right now in Quezon City are familiar with this fountain. Now, on 1995, the original fountain was brought back in Manila, but this time it was not placed to its original location in uh, Nagtahan. Instead, it was uh, placed in the Plaza Santa Cruz. So I think people, uh, especially in nearby Chinatown area, are familiar with this fountain in front of the Santa Cruz Church. Now, a lot of you, especially the people in Quezon City, might be wondering, so what is the fountain that they're seeing right now in front of the MWSS building? So actually, that's a replica of the fountain was made by the National Artist Napoleon Abeba. So in, when the uh, fountain was uh, brought back to Manila, a new fountain, a new replica of the fountain was made in order to be placed in front of the MW, MWSS building that we still see now on that part. Okay, so let's now proceed. Okay, so another fun fact about the El Deposito, so it, uh, it brought water to the whole part of Manila. So it, uh, it was a huge uh, deal for them to have a clean source of water. But uh, during, uh, during the wars, it was also used by the Americans and the Japanese. Uh, the El Deposito also uh, uh, played a huge role in the Philippine Revolution that I think will be discussed later by our next speaker. So here we have the collection of an M1 helmet liner that was found inside the tunnels of El Deposito. So you will notice in the helmet, you will see the name Waltz. So the students can actually create a narrative on this part based on the facts that we have pres uh, that are presented at the museum. So the question is, who is Waltz? So the students can actually make a possible story, an intelligent guess on who the Waltz is. So with this activity, uh, the students were able to have critical thinking uh, to know who Waltz is, what are the possible events that happened to him during that time based on the actual timeline 
of events that happened here in El Deposito. So the El Deposito was used during the 19th century up to the early 20th century. And then it stopped its operation during the 1920s, especially when the Wawa Dam was open. So it became a base of the Americans during the World War II and the Japanese as well. So the tunnels, they cut the water source from the Santolan pumping station in order to water flowing here. And they created the tunnels into an armory. So that is the, the role that El Deposito made during the time of the World War II and the Philippine-American War. So you will see here on the picture on the other side, some soldiers above El Deposito guarding the water reservoir. And then lastly, of course, our very objective in this museum is actually to teach the students on the history of the water system of Manila, how it affected the people during that time. At the same time, we wanted to show the importance of water, sanitation, and sustainability. So here we have a reflection part. So here we presented to you a replica of the water filter used by the family of Jose Rizal. Yes. The family of Jose Rizal also used a water filter system. So this is a big stone. And what they do is they put the water on top of the big stone, and then they wait for the water to drop at the bottom of it, just to make sure that their water is clean. So this is a question, a question for the students that you can do. So do heroes need water, clean water as well? So yes, of course, everyone needs water, and our heroes are no exception, uh, exception to it. So we want to show here the importance of the uh, a source of clean water for everyone. And we also want to show that heroes needs water as well. They're humans as well, just like us. And then another reflection question we can do is what will happen if there was no clean water available during that time? So magkakasakit ba lahat ng tao pag walang clean water? So this is the kinds of question that the students can answer, can reflect to. And then the best uh, uh, question we can ask them, is it easier to have access to clean water now comparing to what we have back then? So dito mas magkakaroon ng idea yung students na pahalagahan yung tubig na kanilang ginagamit sa pang-araw-araw. Kasi when they learn history, they found out that it's very hard for them, for the people back then, to have a clean source of water. So those are the uh, kinds of activities that we can do using our museum collections. So we're still working at it to add more activities. So of course, our teachers can also uh, contact us if they want to have copies of our audiovisual presentation. So our audiovisual presentation has sign, uh, sign language interpretation on the side. So this, is, uh, this video is a five minute video that, show, that shows the history of the Corriado Waterworks in El Deposito. So we also have an available video. So this is a 360 virtual reality video of the Battle of San Juan del Monte and the Battle of Pinaglabana. So the Battle uh, El Deposito was very crucial back then during the time of the revolution because the Katipunan wanted to take over the water system of Manila. Because for them, he who controls the water controls the power. Because the very main seat of the Spanish government is the water from El Deposito. That's why they want to take over the El Deposito back then during that time. So this video is very nice. If you, uh, It is actually available in our NHCP page and our museum page in the Museo El Deposito. You can visit that. Okay. Other digital materials for learning, we could also, uh, we also like you to visit our website, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines website. It's www.nhcp.gov.ph. So on our website, we have an online resource materials, like for example, some copies of the Filipinos in history that you can check out. And of course, if you want to, have to use some films related to history of Bonifacio, uh, Emilio Guinaldo, Apolina Mabini, and about martial law, you can have these videos at the official uh, YouTube channel of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Of course, our museum uh, exhibits, we have exhibits actually, we have two exhibits so far since the open. We have a photo exhibit about the Wawa Dam, so it's entitled Traversing the Current. And then we also had an exhibit and lecture about the bridges 
of Manila during the Spanish period. So we invited back then uh, speaker uh, architect Manolo Noche. And of course, our online programs last uh, Heritage Month and National uh, International Museum Day, we had a museum exhibit entitled History at Home. So what we did, we invited our museum audiences to uh, share to us their collections in their homes related to water. And we were very glad to see very awesome collections. For example, right here, someone shared a banga with a tabo. And then yung tabo actually is made of the coconut shell and then a branch of the tree. So ito yung dati nilang ginagamit to store the water. And then someone also shared to us some old pictures from the 1960s. And of course, they shared to us some of the uh, water canteens used during the World War II. So the reason why they, we made this kind of program is we want to make uh, the, their homes an extension of our museum. So they can dis, uh, discover uh, some of the materials they have while they're in quarantine and then they'll find out na wow, ganito pala yung gamit namin noon na ganito pala yung kwento noon, hindi lang pala siya basta gamit. So people realize the importance of artifacts and collections in telling a story and telling their history. So I, we can suggest that teachers can do that as well as an activity for their students to try to ask their grandparents for some objects related to, for example, World War II, the 1960s, 1950s, and have a show and tell online. And of course, we have some art workshops entitled Too Big at Seening. So last year we had an art workshop, but this year we wanted to, but because of the community quarantine, what we did is that we have an online art exhibit. So the next slide, you will see there, uh, the online exhibit we have is actually ongoing. So if you still want to submit some of your artworks, you can still submit it to us. This is the too big at seeing sa tahanan. Uh, we shared some of the uh, watercolor artworks of our audience in social media. So we are posting our uh, artworks every Tuesdays and, and, no, sorry, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, MWF. So you can still submit it to us. Of course, you've seen a while ago MED. So actually, MED is our part of our information campaign. So we have this program titled MED's Water Facts. So MED's Water Facts, we share different facts about the water history, sanitation, and education through a comic type presentation using MED. So we, uh, you can check this out every Tuesdays and Thursdays in our special museum page. Also, we also have some lectures uh, and talks that we made this year. For example, we have the uh, Uncovering the History Underneath, the Making of the Mosaic al Deposito. This is actually in celebration of our anniversary last February, weeks before the community quarantine. So we had a talk with the people involved in that matter. So of course, we have the Kilapsaw. So not only we want to promote history, but also we want to promote water safety, sanitation, and Education. So we invited two of the water concessioners in Manila, which is Manila Water and Maynila. So last year, we have Manila Water to talk about water safety. And this year, we had uh, Maynila. So on the next part, you will see there our online program that we did last June 6 this year. So we have the webinar on water sanitation and safety. We invited uh, focal persons like uh, the Manila Water Academy, and doctors from San Lazaro Hospital to talk about water sanitation and sustainability. That we do believe that is very timely, especially now in this time of pandemic. Okay, so we are now using online platforms in our different events in order to connect to our budgets. So we also have back then special tours and seminars in partnership with Maynila Water Academy. Back then we have the Ognayang Tubig at Kasaysayan. So we connect history with the water. So So this is a program made for student leaders in Manila. So they are being uh, toured in the different parts of Manila as well, like in Tamuros and of course here in San Juan. And we also have the junior water camp designed for STEM students to know about the how water was delivered back then and how water is delivered now through the different water concessionaires. Okay, so next part. Okay, so this talk is actually very timely because today, August 1, this whole month, we are celebrating the Buwan ng Kasaysayan or National History Month. 
So our theme for this month is pagkakaisaysayan sa paglaban at pagbangon. This is unity and struggle and reco uh, recovery. So we have a lot of programs installed for this month. So kindly check the official Facebook of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines at facebook.com uh, facebook slash NHCP1933. So please check that out to see the different events we have for this month of August for History Month. Okay. And then, of course, on the next part, we will have. We also want to present to you our contact details. So, of course, if you have any questions about museum, if you want to have partnerships with us, if you want uh, to have some copies of our digital materials, you can contact us at uh, seven seven five three five four three nine, and you can email at you can email us at musealdeposito at gmail.com. And of course, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Museo El Deposito. Okay, so that's it, guys. So thank you for listening. So I hope you learned a lot in our talk. So again, feel free to contact me in my contact details if you have any questions about the museum, the waterworks system of Manila, and if you want to have collaboration projects. Maraming salamat. Thanks, Janelle. So that was a very informative talk. If you would <laughs> like to incorporate water into your lesson plans, please do get in touch with Janelle. They're very open to collaborations. So up next, we have Christian. So Christian Melendez earned his degree in history from the University of the East Manila. His career in museum work began in Museo Pambata, where he started out as a museum guide and was later promoted to be its head museum guide. Currently, he is the senior shrine curator of the Museo ng Katipunan Pinaglabanan Shrine in San Juan City. So everybody, yeah, let's welcome in Christian. Hello. Hi. Magandang hapon, isang maulang araw sa mga kapwa ko katipon. Ako nga po pala si Christian Melendez mula sa Museo ng Katipunan. Uh, ang ating discussion na ito sa mga artifacts ng, uh, ng mga bawat museo ng uh, NHCP. So doon tayong iikot yung ating uh, pwentuhan. Okay, uh, simulan natin sa Pinaglabanan Memorial Shrine. Ang Pinaglabanan Memorial Shrine na uh, isang uh, five-hector shrine and it was declared as a national uh, shrine noong 1973, August 1. So in time then, today. Okay, uh, bakit siya ginawang uh, historical site? Kanina, it was mentioned by uh, Mr. Junel na may, meron tayong reserva sa ilalim. No? Pero bukod doon, ang pinaglabanan ng Memorial Shrine kasi na ito ay isang kanyang historicity. So we have the El, El Depositor, the Water Reserva. And at the same time, noong August 30, 1896, yung Battle of Pinaglabanan, the first battle for Philippine independence, dito naganap sa uh, lugar na ito. So, meron po tayong dalawang markers na in-install dito sa uh, Pinaglabanan Memorial Shrine. So, first, we have the pangalalang damban ng Pinaglabanan or uh, Pinaglabanan Memorial Shrine and then yung sa El Deposito nga. Uh, itong dalawang markers na ito, no? uh, before we proceed, meron tayong ano, uh, poll. Sa tingin po ninyo, sino yung mga, sinong government agency ang may authority para mag-conduct or mag-install ng ating mga uh, Historical markers. Okay, so we have mga choices here. First, we have the uh, National Museum, and then we have the NCCA, and then yung NHCP. So we want to hear you, audience, kung ano yung gusto ninyong, or ano yung tingin yung tamang sagot. Sino yung, sinong government agency yung may authority to install historical markers? Okay. So, mamaya, pabalikan natin yan. Oh. Alam natin yung sagot. Okay, next marker. Uh, next uh, slide is Spirit of Pinaglabanan. So, within the Pinaglabanan Memorial Shrine, makikita natin itong uh, sculpture by the late Eduardo Castillo, Spirit of Pinaglabanan. Uh, for those familiar with Mr. Uh, Castillo, yung kanyang mga artworks usually stretch. Okay, so, hindi naiiba itong uh, Spirit of Pinaglabanan. So, it was also built and uh, erected sa Lodong Shrine noong 1972. 73. Okay. At uh, tinayong nga siya para din sa pag sa mga katapangan nila Andres Bonifacio at ang mga uh, katipon na ero. And then, uh, noong 1996 po, meron po tayong uh, itinayo na, na museo ng katipunan or museo ng revolusyon in time dun sa centenary ng Battle of Pinaglabanan. 
So it's the uh, precursor to the latest na mosaic ng katipunan. Sa slide po natin. Okay, uh, next slide please. Okay. Ito yung uh, larawan ng old mosaic ng katipunan. Uh, yung first na old mosaic ng katipunan. And inside, ang makikita nito yung mga facsimile and uh, mga replica ng mga katipunan items such as uh, bolo, antiente, mga medalyon, etc. And then, noong uh, 2013, as part of the modernization project ng uh, museo ng anang uh, NHGP, we opened the new and modernized museo ng Katipunan. So what can we see inside museo ng Katipunan? Uh, as I said a while ago, as part ng uh, modernization ng mga NHGP museums, uh, lahat ng mga museo po ay ginawang interactive and kaya aya sa mata. So kasi before pag sinabi natin na uh, museum nakakatakot, parang eerie feeling pag pumasok. Pero sa mga NHGP museums such as uh, Mosey ng Katipunan, uh, ginawa pa natin modern and then uh, presentable pa, mas presentable pa yung uh, content ng uh, bagong Mosey ng Katipunan. Okay? <coughs> okay. And then, uh, bago tayo magpatuloy, no, let's check the, 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 the survey. Okay, ulitin ko lang, no? what government agency is in charge of approving and installing historical markers? Okay, so some of you answered National Museum, uh, 10 of you, 7% yun. Uh, NCCA, some uh, answered, so 17 people, 17 viewers, so 12% siya. And then uh, some naman answered one, na NHGP consisting of 116 uh, viewers or 81%. Actually, the correct answer is uh, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Okay, uh, by, by the sa Republic Act uh, 468, nung na-establish yung old National Historical Commission, isa sa mga man mandata na ibinigay sa kanila ay uh, magtayo o magkabit ng mga historical markers. So, uh, isa sa mga trabaho nila yon ng NHGP kami, uh, if an individual or private uh, sector magre-request nila ng mga uh, ng review and then pag-aralan ng NHGP, and then kapag na-determine na may historical value yung lugar, yung bahay, kunwari, kakapitan ito ng historical markers. So yun basically ang trabaho ng, isa sa mga trabaho ng uh, NHGP. Okay, so shall, we shall continue, no? Okay. Uh, so museum narrative naman ng Masay ng Katipunan, ng bagong Masay ng Katipunan, uh, basically, as the name implies, ang Masay ng Katipunan po ay patungkol sa mga Katipunero, and syempre, kay Andres uh, Bonifacio na rin. Uh, dito makikita natin yung iba't ibang mga koleksyon, uh, mga interactive exhibit na pwedeng, pwedeng gamitin ng mga teachers kapag sila ay nagturo ng uh, kasaysayan and particularly sa katipunan. Na ito yung mga halimbawa ng aming mga interactive uh, exhibit. So we have yung nasa upper right corner ninyo, yung ang tundo ni Bonifacio. So uh, touch screen siya. So pwedeng uh, uh, i-scroll ng mga, ng mga bisita. Sa lower right, yun tungkol naman sa mga sagisag ng katipunan, yung mga flags, mga seals na ginamit ng mga ba't iba't ibang kasalog ng uh, bayan. And then, yung sa upper left, makikita natin yung mga bata no, while watching or while uh, looking sa mga uh, armaments ng katipunan. And then sa lower uh, left, yung kartilya at dekalogo ng katipunan. So basically, as I said, uh, hindi lang siya for the eyes ng mga bisita yung mga content ng museum. Um, and then, bukod doon, ang mga content ng museum ay yung narrative text stated in English and uh, Filipino. And meron pa mga visual aids. Okay? Ito po po yung mga ipang halimbawa. So makita natin, meron din kami mga interactive exhibit pa. Uh, yung meron kami tinatawag na augmented reality na makikita ninyo sa lower right uh, corner. Kung saan na, uh, dito parang pinapakita namin or pinapalanta namin sa mga bisita yung feel ng Battle of Pinaglabanan. And then, uh, dito naman tayo sa mga museum collections. So, we selected lang no, mga few uh, museum collections ng Masay ng Katipunan. So, iba itatago namin para pag nag-open ng Masay ng Katipunan, uh, after this pandemic, meron pa rin kayong makikita sa loob ng ating museum. Hindi nyo, pa mak hindi nyo makikita na yun sa ating discussion. So, the, the two of the bolos na nandito, no, ana ng weapons is yung uh, dagger sa left. Ang dagger usually ginagamit yan sa mga initiation rites ng katipunan. Na 
Siguro sa iba na hindi hindi natin hindi tayo aware. Ah uh, kapag nag ang mga katipunera nagkakaroon ng initiation rites, hindi sila naghihiwa sa poles, okay? So usually dito sa area na to. Okay. And then the other one, yung bolo, uh, yan naman yung usually ginagamit nila sa ah uh, pakikidigma na. So kumpara from uh, farmland to warland yung kanilang ano, yung, yung sistema diyan. Okay? Another uh, collection ng uh, mosaic ng katipunan ay yung amulet vest. Okay, sa amulet vest naman, no, kasi yung mga katipunan nila naniniwala sila sa bisa ng ating-anting. So, kung makikita nyo sa halimbawa ng vest na yan, uh, pinagsama-sama ng mga katipunan yung, ano, yung kanilang uh, paniniwala, yung prior, yung, yung pre-colonial, tsaka yung uh, uh, pagdating ng makstila. So, nag-fuse na yung kanilang mga Uh, believe. So, yung salang sample niya makikita sa kung ano yung mga nakasulat sa desk. Okay. Another uh, collection sa so, Masay ng Katipunan ay yung uh, bust ni Andres Manifacio, ni Gregor de Jesus, at ni Mio Sinto. Kung makita niyo po siya sa personal, it's uh, medyo, medyo malaki siya sa, sa, sa tao. Okay. And then, uh, ito pa yung gawa ni Miss Julie Luch. Ito pa yung mga new acquired collections ng museo ng katipunan. So kapag kami nagdi-discuss ng, uh, ng uh, mga famous katipaderos, kasama sila sa aming mga ideas discuss And then, uh, bukod sa mga, uh, sa mga sculptures, pwede po kami mga monochrome sketches ng mga katipanero. So we have uh, actually 20 of them, pero nagpumili lang kami ng apat. So we have Maparo Sakay, Emilio Aguinaldo, Jose Dizon, and Marina Dizon. Um, Makare Sakay po, no? na si Makare Sakay, siya yung isa sa mga huling katipunan na sumuko, and then pag suko niya, nang tayo ng mga Amerikano, siya ay in-execute. Yung haba ng buhok niya, na ano niya yan, panata niya yan, na kumbaga parang hanggat niya, tapos yung, yung big man, hindi siya magpapaputol ng buhok. And then you have Emilio Aguinaldo, yung presidente natin, uh, after Andres Bonifacio, Uh, Ididis sa siya ni uh, Miss Polet later. And then, yung mag-ama na si Jose Edison and si, and si Marina Edison, they are actually related kay uh, Emilio Jacinto. Jose Edison was one of the founders of the Katipunan and one of the 13 martyrs ng Bagong Bayan. So, nung nagkaroon ng uh, revolution, uh, nagkaroon ng mga paghuhuli, isa si Jose Edison sa mga nahuli, and later on, na, na abitay sa Bagong Bayan. Si Marina Diso naman, na-survive niya naman yung revolution and namatay siya at old age. And then, uh, mara, meron siyang important uh, role sa katipunan, sa, actually sa women chapter ng katipunan, sa so, mga tagatago ng mga dokumento, kasama si Gregor Radesus, and uh, taga-cover sila sa mga meetings ng mga katipunero. Okay? The next, uh, yeah, before we proceed again sa ating uh, uh, In sa ating sa lecture, magkaroon ulit tayo ng panibagong poll. No? Uh, we would like to know, audiences, kung, who is your favorite underrated katipan? No? Kasi we know of uh, Andres Bonifacio, Emilio Asinto. Yan. Ano na lang, uh, pili kayo. Gusto namin malaman kung sino sa apat na pinakita namin yung favorite underrated katiponero. Okay? And habang kayo bumuboto, uh, balikan na lang po natin sila at move tayo sa ating uh, next uh, slide. Ah, uh, sure. Okay. Ah, uh, sure, sige. Pero, uh, let, sige, let's proceed na na sa, na sa next slide. Ayan. Ah, uh, ito naman po yung mga samples ng mga painting or uh, collection din ng uh, mosaic ng katipunan. Ito po ay magawa ng ating mga uh, local artist. Ah, uh, this one, Ito po gawan Mr. Pancho Piano, uh, a painter from Bicol. This painting, uh, the depiction ng tukol sa buhay ni Andres Bonifacio. So, central sa, sa painting ay yung uh, pagkapanganak niya. The next one ay yung tukol naman sa revolution. So, once again, si Bonifacio yung centerpiece ng kanyang painting at ito pinapakita ka yung iba't ibang uh, uh, scenery sa revolution. Next, another painting of Pancho Piano. We have the Ang Dapat Babatid ng mga Tagalog. Actually, this painting is an, uh, is an artist rendition ng Ang Dapat Babatid ng, ng mga Tagalog ni Andres Bonifacio. It's an essay. So makikita ninyo, no? uh, nagkumuha tayo ng excerpt dun sa essay ni Andres Bonifacio. And then ang tinutukoy yan, yung lower 
left ng painting. So kumbaga parang sa ang dapat babatid ng mga Tagalog ni Andres Bonifacio, kinatalakay niya kung ano yung naging, naganap sa Pilipinas bago dumating ang mga Kastila, noong dumating ang mga Kastila, uh, at kung aalis sa mga Kastila nung panahon nila. So yung so, sa pinili natin na excerpt, ayan uh, yung, yung dumating ang mga Kastila, nangako sila ng uh, kung ano-ano, ng magandang buhay. Pero later on, uh, ano pa, kahirapan pala ang bigay nila sa atin. And then, another one, ito naman ang ibang painting naman to, uh, ito yung preparation ng mga uh, katipunera sa digmaan. Ang painting po nito ay si Juanito Torres. Uh, for some, kung hindi niyo pa siya kilala, no, ang isa sa mga trademark ng kanyang uh, painting ay yung aso. So for this particular painting, makikita po ba natin yung aso? Akala niya ba? Yes, nandun sana sa ilalim ng isang lalaki. So basically yan. Ngayon, ito po yung mga halimbawa lamang ng mga uh, collections ng Museo ng Katipunan. So hindi pa namin pinakitala para surprise sa pagbabalik. Ngayon, ang tanong po, which is yung umigit sa, uh, sa ating topic, no? uh, how museum artifacts are utilized in teaching history. Sa amin sa Museo po ng Katipunan, we are using uh, several factors or we are considering several factors yung sa approaches ng, uh, sa pagtuturo sa mga bata ng ating mga collections. Uh, basically, we have to understand that Museo ng Katipunan and other museums also ay a place for alternative learning. So, ikumpara natin sa eskwelahan na mayroong four corners of the room, meron siyang specific subject na tinuturo, na itinuturo sa specific level ng mga bata. Dito, dito po sa Museo ng Katipunan, uh, we are expecting na sa isang bagsakan, meron kami nga harapin na iba't ibang uh, level na, na mga bata. Uh, yung siyempre mga, yung kanilang bilis din, okay, gano'n sila ang magtatagal sa museum. So yun po yung mga kinukonsider po namin. So basically, una po na po, yung types of service. First, uh, ito po yung usually binibigay ng Museo ng Katipunan, tour guiding and public programs. Then kapag tour guiding naman po, we consider, tinatanong din namin sa mga bisita, especially kapag yung Papa Book, uh, anong grade level. Before po, ang mga museums pa ng NHP were not accepting grade 4 students and below. Kasi since ang tema po ng ating mga museum sa history, maha, mahirap siyang ipaintindi sa mga bata. No? Pero since kami nag-modernize na nga po, nag naglagay kami ng interactive exhibits, na, nagkaroon kami ng iba't-ibang approaches, uh, so, nagtatanggap na rin po kami ng mga uh, grade 4 pababa ng mga sadyante. At doon po papasok yung ating iba't-ibang uh, style. So halimbawa po, doon sa, no, sa, sa kung grade 4 pababa, Ang ginagawa lang po namin ay yung tinatawag namin expository tour. So kung nangari, pupunta sila sa museum, sa museum ng Katipunan, itinuturo lang namin kung ano yung mga itsura ni Andres Bonifacio, ni Gregorio de Jesus, o kung 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 sila mga tawag. Supremo, uh, Katipunero, mga ganyan. Kasi in that way, we are hoping na somehow, merong magiging ano, merong may iwan sa kanila. Kasi mahirap naman talaga ituro sa mga bata na grade 4 pa baba, yung kung nangari, complexity ng Katipunan, yung mga yung mga graph history, etc. Now, for public programs naman po, we are following this guide sa pag-conceptualize ng mga public programs. Uh, since you are targeting uh, all uh, audiences, kumbaga parang ka kailangan is uh, sa buong taon makapag-book kami ng mga programa na makapag-provide sa lahat ng uh, grade level or, or readiness ng mga tao. So ito pong uh, sa ating slide, makikita natin yung uh, ginagamit namin para mag, ano, maggawa ng mga public programs in line or na nakadepende dun sa target audience namin. For, for example pa, no, uh, commemorative events, we, so usually we have three commemorative events na ginagawa sa loob ng Pinaglabanan Memorial Shrine. We have the Independence Day every June 12, uh, Battle of Pinaglabanan Day, August 30, and uh, Bonifacio Day noong every November 30. So usually ang aming target audience sa mga commemorative events ay general public. Okay? And then sa... Uh, kung gusto naman namin mag-target ng uh, programa para sa mga college levels and, and mga professionals, we do lecture po. So mamaya makikita po natin mga uh, sample. For workshops, depende rin po yan. No? Uh, kung ang target natin is high school students and above, we do photography, art, tour guiding, and writing workshops po. And then kung sa mga estudyante naman from the elementary, we do painting, clay molding uh, workshop. Or kung ano mga, mga workshops sa pwedeng i-apply sa mga bata. Madaling ituro sa mga bata. For traveling din po, uh, depende rin po yan. No? Uh, Mamaya makikita natin kung ano yung mga sample na pwede sa mga adult, then meron para sa mga bata. 
And then contest, usually para po, uh, depende ulit yan kung photography ulit, uh, graphic design contest, etc. And then meron kaming specific na ginagawa every two years na programa for uh, mga elementary and high school students. Ito yung team pala kasaysayan. Uh, basically, dapat doon kami for this year 2020. Pero since may pandemic, lahat ng aming mga public programs ay kinansal muna. And then we have yung mga special programs doon ng mga heritage tours and other uh, collaborations. Okay? Sige po. Uh, ito, dadaan lang parati yung mga museum programs ng NHCP uh, ng Museum Active Plan. So, so ganoon kami before yung Bulilas Spoken Word Poverty Workshop. And then yearly, nagkakanta kami ng bye-bye workshop. So uso ngayon yan. So meron kami partner from uh, San Juan City na nagkakanta ng bye-bye workshop. And then, uh, Pintig, dito naman po, ini-introduce namin yung mga ethnic musical instruments uh, na munti-unti na nakakalimutan ng, uh, ng publiko. So dito, reintroduction, tapos pinapagamit na pinapatutug namin sa mga uh, participants. Ito naman po yung mga lectures na ginagawa namin uh, through the years. Uh, itong mga nakalang taon, meron kami yung mga sesquicente niya lecture series. So yung mga lesser known katipuneros na nagkaroon tayo ng uh, ano lang 150 years, both kina Bonifacio at Rizal, uh, sinelebrate natin through lectures. And then yung mga uh, mga God activists din po natin. Uh, so first, meron tayong history blogging na ginawa noon. And then uh, for Women's Month, nagkanda kami ng lecture about sa mga kababaihan sa katipunan. And this one, this activity, ito yung mga para naman sa mga kabataan. So, uh, yung malikayang kabataan sa pinaglabanan, ginagawa rin namin siya every two years. And then, uh, kung mapapasin nyo yung mga the past activities namin yan, pinagawa namin yung mga bata ng anting-anting sa clay, ng mga bolo sa clay, and then nagamit kami ng painting workshop at yung dalawang sample yung nasa baba. And then, ito po yung aming mga traveling exhibits, uh, yung A Moment for the Monument. Uh, ito naman ay patungkol sa monument ni Anas Bonifacio sa Kaloocan. So mostly, narrative text to. So uh, applicable siya sa mga older uh, audience. And then we have here, yung palarong katipunan sa inyong kanan. Uh, dito naman, makikita, ginawa namin ng uh, uh, snake and ladders form, yung mga events sa katipunan. So kapag maganda yung nangyari sa katipunan, up, yung mga medyo uh, marubdob, yung mga yung malungkot, And, um, so, naka-display siya sa loob ng uh, Museo na katipo ng Premis. And then, tour guiding workshop. And then, uh, yung uh, San Juan City Heritage Tour. Na, before kasi, gano'n kami na ano, pag-iikot sa loob ng San Juan City. So, lahat ng mga uh, historical sites sa San Juan, inikot namin. And then, uh, last two years or three years, nagkaroon kami ng pinaglabanan. So, uh, tinayman namin sa pangalan ng uh, shrine. Uh, tukol sa mga sana sa love. Okay? And then yung team pala kasi sana niya po, ito naman para sa mga audience natin, grade 4, uh, high school and pababa. So konti siya para siyang mini Olympics na uh, nag-participate yung mga uh, estudyante natin. And then as I mentioned before, commemorative events, we have Independence Day, Battle of Pinaglabanan Day, and Bonifacio Day. And uh, this time of pandemic po kasi, no, uh, nakasa lahat ng mga programa ng uh, ng NCT ng Masay na Katipunan. So ang aming only uh, option para makaka-connect pa rin sa ating mga bisita ay through online. So this uh, pandemic, nag-conduct muna kami ng mga mini activities sa sa aming Facebook page. So pwede niyo siyang i-check later. So for example, we have our crossword puzzles na lumalabas every uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Tuesday yung tanong, Wednesday yung sagot. Yung word hunt naman, na may short description, as uh, lumalabas siya every Thursday and Friday. And then every Saturday and Sunday, lumalabas naman yung, ito, kunwari, who's that katipunero? Pahula niyo kaya siya? And ang mga clue natin, graduate siya from the University, University of Santo Tomas, College of Medicine. Uh, member siya ng Kamara Negro ng Katipunan. At isang lungsod ang ipinangalan sa kanya. Bukod doon, naging, uh, siya, naging uh, gobernador ng Bulacan noon. So mahulaan ba siya? Mamaya balikan natin. And then nagpo-post din kami ng mga, yung mga memes Ayan, kumaga para makasabay tayo sa uso. Kaya tulad yan, akala ko saligas sa Cry of Pugod Lawin. Sagot ng bata, naiwan ko po ang sedul ako. And then yan, yung mga memes sa sumikat noon na applicable sa katipunan. So yung mga lighter side lang na katipunan na pinapost natin. And then yung mga online commemorations while we are using the uh, museum collections. Yung mga halimbawa. So from left to right, uh, Cry of Pugod Lawin, uh, 150th birthday ni Pio. Yung birthday naman ni Bonifacio and then last yung birthday ni uh, Emilio Asinto. 
And then we also have National Flag Days noong May 28, June 12. And then ginawa namin online yung supposedly uh, walk, ano, na history walk tour po namin. Ang usay na katipunan din po is, ano, is open for collaboration. So ito yung mga past collaborations namin. Uh, yung tara ng lunar eclipse, nakipagtaya kung saan nila astronomers para doon mag-contact sa shrine ng, uh, ng star gazing. Tapos uh, yung mga three planting activities, storytelling session, Uh, and then yung fire prevention naman. And then, uh, ito lang nakaraan, yung in line with the celebration or commemoration of uh, uh, hepatitis, nag-ilaw ang mga museo at samang museo na katipunan ng green sa aming mga uh, And then, uh, nabangat niya kanina, no? uh, today is the start of the history month and uh, ang museo na katipunan po yung mag-launch ng mga, uh, sa mga sumusunod ng mga programa sa buwan ito and sa mga susunod na buwan pa. So, we have two uh, katipon na focus. We will feature Pio Valenzuela and Makaro Sakai. Uh, gagawin din po namin online yung Malikhan to Batan sa Pinaglabanan. And then we will also uh, launch a comic strip featuring Lolo Donato and Bolo Bonito. Yes. And then, uh, so before we end the discussion, oh, abalik tayo dito. So, sino kayo makahuhula ng tama sagot? Who's that katipo na lo? Ang answer ay... Yan, he's P.U. Valenzuela. So, recently in July 11, nag-birthday siya. Nag-end na yung kanyang 150th uh, birth commemoration. Okay? And then, nabalik din po natin kanina, no? Uh, who, is, who is your favorite underrated katipo na ero? So, according to you, viewers, ang pinaka-pablito niyo underrated katipo na ero ay si Emilio Cinto. Ayan. Um, so, uh, to, end na my, uh, to end my discussion, okay, ito po yung mga contact details ng uh, museo ng Katipunan. So, if you want to uh, inquire about the museo, so you can ask us sa mga sumusod na mga contact details. For now, uh, bagamat ng GCP na po ang uh, Metro Manila, no, we are not still opening the doors of museo ng Katipunan. So, we will still continue yung ating mga online activities. And then, kung meron po kayong mga inquiries, mga uh, katanungan pa po, mga uh, clarifications, you can contact us po niya sa mga naibigay po na contact details. Ayan po. Thanks, Christian. Last but not least, we have Paulette. Um, she, is, she has worked in different historical and arts museums, including Museo de la Salle and Museo Orlina in Tagaytay City. Her museum experiences range from research collections, management, exhibitions, and museum administration. So just about everything. A graduate of arts management from the University of the Philippines, Manila, she is currently the Shrine Curator too of the Museo Ni Emilio Aguinaldo in Kawit Cavite. So Paulette, hello. Hi Yuri, good afternoon everyone. Maraming salamat Yuri for the introduction. And it's great to have this online platform to help us continue uh, to share the mandate of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines to promote Philippine history and cultural heritage. But before anything else, allow me to give you a background of the Museo ni Emilio Aguinaldo in Kawit Cavite, which is one of the 27 museums of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. So the museum is the ancestral house of Emilio Aguinaldo, a revolutionary and president of the first Philippine Republic. He was born and raised in this house. So the original structure was built in 1845 using bamboo and touched materials. It was built as a family home of the Emilio's parents, Don Carlos Aguinaldo y Jamir, and Doña Trinidad's family. So to accommodate their growing family by 1849, the house was reconstructed using limestone and hardwood. It's very similar to the traditional Bahay na Bato, and it was dubbed as the House of History because the, ha the Aguinaldo House witnessed an important event in history, which is the Declaration of Philippine Independence on June 12, 1898. So there's a question, Yuri. Which... Okay, so Paulette asked us this during the rehearsal. Where did Emilia Aguinaldo declare the Philippine independence? Is it A, the garden, B, the balcony, C, the window, or D, the front door? So um, I think there are two slightly obvious answers. 
But there was a fun fact that Paulette told us that like definitely changed my initial answer. So Ayan, where do you think you can hold the Declaration of Independence? Is it on a garden party? Is it on your balcony? Is it on a window? Is it on the lobby, the front door? Like just have like a gate and then open it and then that's where you have the declaration. Please answer it in the poll. We're very, very curious to find out. So Paulette, do you have, well, you know the answer. Yeah, I know the answer. <laughs> but before you worked for the museum, um, was your answer different? Well, I, I think I'm quite old. So probably I've seen a, a photo somewhere that it's different from the facade that we see now. Yeah. So I think I think there's the answer here. The, okay. the poll is out. Okay, so most of the people answered balcony. 66% answered balcony to be followed by 34% window and then zero for garden and front door. Okay, please tell yeah. us the correct answer. It is at the window. Because for those who's familiar with the five peso bill, it featured the proclamation of Philippine independence at the reverse side, showing Aguinaldo waving the flag at the window. But this photo in the slide is actually an artist's rendition of the event and it's one of the closest to what really happened based on accounts because it was really Ambrosio Riazares Bautista who read the act of proclamation of independence while waving the flag. So the house became a revolutionary abode as it joins the revolution in 1896. And that's the time when Aguinaldo became a general. And of course, that event in 1898, the, the proclamation of Philippine independence. And then after the revolution, um, Emilio Aguinaldo was captured in Isabella by the Americans. He eventually retired as a uh, private individual in his house. So by the 1920s, major renovations were done. Uh, the tower was built. A common structure added to some of the houses during that time. And it was also around that time that the famous balcony that we see today was constructed. It was a reminder of the historic event that took place in this house. And then when you go visit the Aguinaldo Shrine, you'll see a lot of nationalistic symbols because Emilio Aguinaldo also embellished the house with symbols such as the sun, the stars, or even the Philippine flag. In 1963, a year before he passed away, he donated the house and the land to the Filipino people. So this one is a photo of Emilio Aguinaldo signing the deed of donation on the occasion of his 94th birthday on March 22, 1963. So looking at the right is Mrs. Maria Agoncillo Aguinaldo, his second wife. And when Aguinaldo died the next year, which is 1964, a month after, President Justado Macapagal issued Executive Order Number 73, assigning the care and custody of the Aguinaldo Mansion to the National Museum. But it was only Republic Act Number 4039 enacted on June of the same year that officially named the Aguinaldo Mansion as a national shrine. But um, in 1972, President Marcos issued another executive order, number 370. It formally, formally transferred the custody of the Aguinaldo Shrine from the National Museum to the National Historical Commission, which is now the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. So from then on until the present, the Aguinaldo Shrine had several renovations. But the major renovation took place before 1998 because that was the time that the country celebrated the centennial anniversary of the Philippine independence. And then at that time, the lot in front of the house was converted into the Aguinaldo Park. And in 2015, when the National Historical Commission of the Philippines had its modernization project, uh, the Aguinaldo Shrine opened as the Museo ni Emilio Aguinaldo with interactive exhibit at the ground level. So the house has seven floors, but five of these you only access through the tower. There is only two levels that is open to the public. Um, the house is uh, um, the, uh, the ground level. It's uh, the museum. It houses the exhibition of the life and the contribution of Emilio Aguinaldo to the nation. It has four galleries and it presents the Cavite during the Spanish colonial period. It, also shows the revolution against Spain until the proclamation of the independence. And it covers the aftermath of the revolution until the Philippines war against the United States. 
And then the second level, which is the living space of the house, which is very similar to the traditional bahay na bato, is a structure. Uh, structure. Uh, there's the living spaces. So there's the living room, the bedrooms, the dining area, the kitchen. Every room's living space can be found on this second floor. And this also uh, houses, these also houses the 19th century and early 20th century furniture and details of the Art Nouveau and the Art Deco. So very notable are the Mesa altar, the large dining table, attic beds, secret compartments. And then visitors, when they come visit the museum, they would ask, well, how come there's a lot of furniture in the house? Like there's so many tables and chairs. And this is because Aguinaldo entertained a lot of people and he opened his home to a lot of personalities like diplomats, politicians, and especially the veteranos who are the veterans of the revolution. So with our collection, there is also this table. This is a very large, huge table in the dining area. It's made of one singular wood slab. It's a gift to the general by a furniture factory, Gonzalo Puyat, on his 73rd birthday. And beside it is a mesa altar made of kumagong, and it was made in 1722. There okay. is another pop question, Yuri. How tall is Emilio Aguinaldo? Is he 5'1? Or is he 5'2? Or is he 5'3? Or is he 5'4? So, Palette, can you give us some context as to why 5'4 and below yung height ni Emilio Aguinaldo? Because when, uh, you know, people will ask whenever there's tours and they see the personal effects on the ground level, they will ask us na, how come the how come it's the the the, the uniforms or the the clothes are really small? So the range is really low because medyo ano siya, medyo malikip. <laughs> so just for context, no, Jose Rizal is also I think. Five I, two, or something like that. I, yeah, I think. Oh my gosh, I think smaller. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's also not very tall. So when you like see these great history men, but sometimes oh my god, you got like he's five nine or six foot. But then like when you see their things in scale, it's like. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, like if you're if you're a general in a revolution, you'll think that these guys are really tall. Like when you go into yeah. into the military, right? Yeah. So yeah, it, it was also very strange for us when Paulette was like, okay, like th this is his actual height. And we're like, huh, <laughs> really? So yeah, so if you're five four, I think that's on the taller end of the spectrum. So, okay, so the results are out. Yes. 41% think he's 5'2", 25% says he's 5'1", 18% for 5'4", and 16% for 5'3". And he's 5'3". He's five three, <laughs> so he's around my height. Yes, <laughs> taller than me. So like this one, this is the uniform that he used during the revolution. It's called the Rayadillo, and then beside it are the other collection. We have a boots and the and the salakot, and then there, this one is um portable picnic box with plates and spoon and fork, which can transform into a small table when you need to use it outside. So the museum also has a collection of different weapons during the revolution, such as that shown in the picture, the polos, the arrows, and the rifles. So usually they would have guns only when, like the revolver, revolvers when they're members of the Masons, or like they gathered it from the battles wall. So this collection of the museum, the artifacts, are usually the point of discussion whenever we have do educational tours. But aside from the tours, we also have public programs such as commemorative events, lectures and exhibitions and other educational programs. For Mayo, we have three commemorative events. We're celebrating his death anniversary in February and his birth anniversary in March. And then every year, uh, every June 12th, we're part of the nation's celebration of Independence Day. And then for the lectures, the Museo Ni Emilio Aguinaldo has two annual institutional lectures, an annual uh, an artist talk uh, during the National Arts Month, which is February, and then Kabita Saisayan in November. 
For the artist talk, we had Na Aizong, that's the slide earlier. He is a crochet artist. And we invited him because crochet art was a common skill learned during the 1900s. But, but as an artist, he elevated the craft into an art form. And then Ramon Orlina, the glass sculptor, talked about built heritage in his hometown, Taal Batangas, and his advocacy to keep those built heritage alive. Um, just last February, we had Khalil Banyares for Directing History. He talked about film and its role in educating the viewers about history. For Kabita Saisayan, this one is focused on uh, history, culture, and arts in Kabite. So for the past three years, we had, next slide please, we had Mr. Jeff Lubang who discussed Panchon. It's the tradition of Burying uh, in Cavite, so tradition ng paglilibing sa Cavite. We have Dr. Jakes Medina who talked about the fashion during the time of Aguinaldo. Moda sa kanyang panahon. And the last one we had last year was Dr. Manny Calairo who shared gita gintong aral sa buhay ninyo. So this year because of the pandem pandemic, we are shifting online. So instead of doing the regular lecture, we're doing it like this one through Facebook, and we'll have the lecture of Ms. Rosani Recreo Serile on Cavite artists as film icons in Philippine cinema. So aside from that, we also produce changing exhibition for our returnees. Kasi parang when they come back to the museum, they'll see another exhibit, not just our permanent exhibit. So normally, we'll also have two exhibits a year, one in February for National Arts Month, and then another one in October for the Museums and Galleries Month. Some of our exhibit is this Not Art by Miss Bernadette Solina Wolf, titled She Drew It in a Nutshell. We also had a historical exhibit, 1869, Cementing the Road to Independence. And then Identity on a Shifting Landscape that gave a glimpse on the different roles of the Aguinaldo Shrine in its 175 years of existence. Last February, we opened our latest exhibition in transition, The Baby Bus of Cavite. These are photographs of a uh, Cavite new artist, Heinz Raymond Orais. We opened it in the middle of February. So the exhibit run was cut short because it was supposed to run until May. But because of the pandemic, we resorted to bring, to bring it online. So if you want to check out the exhibit, it's still up in our Facebook page. So you can like our Facebook page and view the exhibit from your home. So we also have collaborative programs with other institutions, like these two programs that I'll be discussing are the programs that we had in celebration of the 150th birth anniversary of Emilio Aguinaldo, the exhibit Sinag, Tracing Emilio Aguinaldo's Palette with Moseo de la Sal and Iget Ramos Design Studio. This one is interesting because we were able to get the help of multimedia, artist students of De La Salle University to do the exhibit featuring infographics on the history of food and its relation to Aguinaldo's concept of the nation. For the next collaborative program, we have Sa Aming Tahanan, a first-person interpretation program which is created by Fundacion Santiago. It runs as a special tour of the house wherein the guests are assisted by a facilitator to different locations in the Aguinaldo Shrine. There, uh, in these locations, there, they would meet several characters. Well, three characters do, uh, during different periods. Um, we have one, the um, mother of Emilio Aguinaldo, Doña Tenec, and two composite characters, Berto, uh, the veterano, and Caridad, the house help. So visitors will get a chance to interact with these characters and they can even ask questions afterwards. This is very engaging for students and even adults because we received a lot of interesting questions do, during its run. Like, mabait po ba na anak sinyo? Or ano po yung paborito niyang pagkain? Or uh, si Aguinaldo ba ang nagpapatay kay Bonifacio? Which the mother cannot answer because the year you admit her will be 1886. And around that time, Emilio Aguinaldo is around 17 years old. Also, this program was supposed to run until June this year and the cut then because of the pandemic, but Fundacion Santiago is looking on the possibility of bringing it online. So also, please like their Facebook page, Sa Aming Tahanan, for updates. We also have uh, an annual bloodletting activity during History Month in partnership with the 
Philippine Red Cross Cavite City Chapter. So I'll be focusing on our educational programs. It's very quick. We only have three to, to show you. The, these educational programs we were able to conceptualize as a result of a training facilitated by the NHCP in 2016. So we had a training history museum as a learning tool. From there, the participants were trained to create lesson, like lesson plans using museum objects and materials. So we were able to come up with various programs which are object-based, such as Ablamos talking artifacts. So Ablamos is the conjugation of the Spanish word ablar, which means to talk, because we animated 12 of our collections and allow them to talk and share their stories be before they became museum objects. So each object uh, shares something about itself, and they share their stories before they become, became museum objects. Um, and they will relate trivia that is actually related also to the present. So these allow the students to see the importance of studying museum objects as a relic of the past, but still relevant today and to the future. So to further engage, we produce comic strips, which we also uploaded in Facebook. So you can also check it out. It's all in one um, album. So you can check all the 12 comic strips strips that we produced in 2017. And during the time that it was running, we also printed this comic strip. So when you visit the museum, you can actually get one and bring it home. This one is one of the successful programs of the museum in terms of cost cutting because the artists were all pro bono. So these are friends of the museum or NHCP friends. Uh, yeah, and also the, the Ablamos also included a pocket exhibit. So every month, each artifact will feature in a specific space in the museum, accompanied by a recorded speaker, which actually talks, and a caption, which you can read. So after the 12 featured artifacts, we exhibited uh, them the year after through the exhibit Repaso Ablamos in Retrospect. Since the some of the objects in our um, Ablamos program were huge and even attached to the ceiling, we opted to make a mobile application that you can download and listen to while going around the museum. So that's the picture of the students with downloaded application and going around the museum listening to this artifact talking. So another program that we did, which is an educational program, is Kawit on Foot. It is a walking tour designed for kids, which we introduced Kawit the town of Kawit as Cavite El Viejo. So Cavite El Viejo is the old name of the town, which it took during the establishment of the port of Cavite, which is Cavite City. So the activity aims to guide the students to identify the significance of the places that they're going to visit in the social historical context of the town. So it allowed the students to imagine and explore um, the lifestyle of the Coiteño during the Spanish period and connects it to the value of the structures and industries from the past to the present and to create awareness and pride and eventually concern in the preservation of our, uh, of our local heritage. Uh, this is a very good introduction to the history of the town for kids because they were given an interactive map, the, uh, the slide before, so they have an interactive map with tasks and location to visit. So the facilitator will identify the correct answers of each task given. The first stop, of course, is the Aguinaldo Park, where they are tasked to count the total number of flags. Um, and the answer will be 100, because the park was built during the centennial celebration of the Philippine independence. So then they, they will proceed to the other location, which is the St. Mary Magdalene Church, the Pandayan, and then in the Pandayan, they will try to hammer the blades of the bolos, and then the last stop will be the Aguinaldo House, where they, where they will listen again to an Ablamos artifact, which is uh, the Neveras or the ice box, and answer an evaluation and test afterwards. The project is also online, but it's more of an infographic rather than an activity format. And the last program is Lyell, Experiential Learning Using Museum Artifact. This one utilizes history museum as an alternative classroom for learning. The, the aim of the program is to engage the students in analyzing 
uh, a museum object beyond its aesthetic and external value. So this will allow the students to experience the objects using other techniques that will heighten their senses and develop analytical thinking. So our first object that we use during the program is a painting by Vicente Dizon, The Battle of Sapote. Instead of just discussing what happened during the Battle of Sapote, the students were given an activity sheet, the one that you're seeing right now. And then for the first part of the program, I, for the first part of the activity, they will be asked the, the, the gawain one, bilugan ang mali sa larawan. So what's wrong in the picture? So instead of you seeing arrows flying at the background, you'll see missiles and other weird objects in the painting. So there's also an activity of you drawing the weapons that you see in the museum and getting the information from the caption. So after this, the facilitator will introduce the artifact and discuss the topic, which is the weapons of the revolution. The student will share the weapons they drew and the information that's available in the museum. So basically, Lyo is giving freedom to the students to learn on their own while you're inside in the museum, of course, be, uh, guided by the worksheet and facilitated by either a curator, the museum guide, and eventually if the teachers can do them, can do this by themselves. Uh, the second object, just to give you another artifact, is Inang Bayan. It's a relief found at the ceiling of the Grand Hall, and the program included um, a short film of the proper respect of our national flag. The activity includes word hunt of the images and the objects, like this one, there's the word hunt. And you will look for the images and objects that you can see in the Inang Bayan relief. And then they will also be provided with crayons to give color to Inang Bayan and how they see, you know, interpret Inang Bayan when they try to color it, kung masaya ba siya or malungkot ba siya, things like that. So, LIO is our attempt to produce lesson plans for teachers to use as an alternative way of teaching Araling Panlipunan. Um, we had a roundtable discussion with the Araling Panlipunan teachers um, in Kawit under Ms. Susan Aquino and then Ms. Cecil Galicami of Masaya de la Sal because her thesis was OBL or object-based learning approach. So they find the program interesting, but we realized that the problem was logistic. So um, sabi ng mga teachers, um, when they do the discussion, it's probably around the same time. And when they come to the museum discussing a certain uh, topic in their curriculum, they will come in bulk and the museum will not be able to accommodate them. So what they suggested was we bring the museum to the classroom. But the, at that time when we were producing the program, what we thought was we really wanted to bring the students into the museum. So with this pandemic, we realized that indeed the idea of bringing the museum to the classroom and probably online will continue the learning process and at the same time make museum matters and relevant, diba? So we are tweaking the program a little to make it applicable in the blended learning being introduced now to our museum programs. And maybe our museum programs will be an alternative teaching material or something to augment the learning process. So, sige, please wait a little as we adapt to the new normal in terms of our educational program. But as of now, during our GCQ, we produce online programs for everyone to check out on our Facebook page. We have the engaging post, Sino ka? Next slide, please. Which is asking the audience kung kanino ka mas nakaka-relate sa object. Like, for example, this one. Ikaw ba yung nagbibigay ginhawa na si Atay Bed? Or ikaw ba yung maaasahan na si Ben Botikin? So with you choosing, there's actually no wrong answer. So pag you choose lang, we will relate that um, value of the artifact to the value that you will learn in studying the life of Emilio Aguinaldo. So like for example, ikaw yung nagbibigay ginhawa because Emilio Aguinaldo gave a help to the veteranos after the revolution. Uh, things like that. So while our doors are still closed for visit, we open our windows through our program behind the cookies window, the Maya collection. So in this one, we are featuring a, a lot of our collection with their descriptions and news and other interesting trivia. And speaking of trivia, there's also a trivia post, which is Akalain Mo, Aguinaldo, Kasaysayan, Atako, featuring trivia about Aguinaldo, the house, 
and everything na makaka-relate ang mga tao, giving us a glimpse of the life of the historical figure minus the dates, the events, and making them more human. Like this one, si Aguinaldo din ay nagpapagupet, just like all of us. So please like our page. You will see a lot of our programs there. And then like this one, we had a lot of videos that we posted from the programs that we facilitated throughout the years. And in case you find anything interesting, you may contact us through our website, through our email address and Facebook, the Facebook account. So para we can help you use our program in your teaching uh, Philippine history to the students. And also we are in, uh, in Instagram and Twitter. It's all Aguinaldo Shrine. So please like and follow us. Those are our details. You can email us at maseoneemilioaguinaldo at gmail.com and our contact details there. So that's it. Maraming salamat po. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Paulette. Um, yeah, so thanks for tuning in, everybody. You can get your certificates through a link by Viba that, we will, that we've pinned on the comment section and have also put on our event page. If it's not yet up, we will put it back in later. Um, you can catch your next live stream on August 8th at 2 p.m. at the following pages at Vibal Group, Chinatown Museum, and Ila Ila Museum of Contemporary Art. Our next show will be on how teachers can use... Oh, hold on. Um, before that, here, in case you want to screenshot it, is a list of all our contact details. So if you want any kind of educational material from us, the best way to contact us is through email. Everyone's pretty responsive. We can attest to that. So if you have anything that you want from us, we can surely give it to you. Okay. So our next live stream next week on August 8th at 2 p.m., you will be able to find it on Vibal Group, Chinatown Museum, and Ailo Museum of Contemporary Art. Our next show will be on how teachers can use museum programs from contemporary art museums in digital learning. So this is different from all the other things we've done because this focuses on the programs that are already up and running. The event page is in Chantan Museum, but we will also publish it later with Vipal. We encourage you to RSVP it on the next on the next few event pages so we can keep you posted for updates and the release of certificates. So thanks for tuning in and have a great day.